Picture this scenario, you have an asymptomatic molar with a large behemoth amalgam restoration. You think it looks a little bit worse for wear, so you plan an indirect restoration, let's say an onlay. And everything goes smoothly, you did it under rubber dam, and it looks beautiful, and you followed all the adhesive principles. But unfortunately, this asymptomatic tooth became very symptomatic, and now you're looking at a pulpitis, and the patient needs a root canal. Now, sometimes the patient is upset. Does this sound familiar? Well, if this doesn't sound familiar, then you probably haven't done enough dentistry, because this is something that we face. It's a real-world problem. It's no one's fault that this happened. It's just biology. But attached to this scenario, our emotions and feelings of the patient which can sometimes be quite bitter. So today we tackle the clinical part of the scenario in terms of what do we do, how do we prevent this from happening, what kind of communication should be happening with the patient to preempt this kind of scenario and the medical legally how can we protect ourselves. I'm joined by a fantastic dentist called Dr. John Swabrig and Dr. Neil Jaswal. Together they are two of the nicest guys in dentistry. And yes, my voice does sound a little bit different. I'm sick again. Like, oh, literally I was sick three weeks ago. I don't know what, it's like a chest infection this time. It's the, all these bugs that the kids bring from the school, but I'm powering through. I'm powered by coffee. And I'm also powered by your love on social media and also on YouTube. It's been amazing to have all these new listeners join and all the veterans who've been listening to the podcast for so many years to be part of the community on Telegram or the Facebook group or the app itself. Thank you so much to all of you for supporting Protrusive Dental Podcast. As you know, every PDP episode, I give you a Protrusive Dental Pearl. And today is a bit of a funny one. It's an app I want to recommend. And I don't know if it's an international app or not. I know it's in the UK, but I don't know if it's international. But I love the concept. So maybe in your country, you have something similar. It's called Too Good To Go. So picture this. Costa or Starbucks, they have some really nice sandwiches and muffins that are delicious, but they expire on that day. So instead of throwing it away, how about you purchase it for a absolute bargain. So instead of playing like, you know, 12 pounds, you're paying like three pounds, for example. And you're also saving the environment because you're preventing waste. So I'm totally addicted to this. I've been using it for the past few weeks now. I've been telling all my practice where I work about it, all the receptionists, all the nurses are on board. So the Too Good To Go app has just been absolutely brilliant. As you know, I do love a good bargain. I like that feeling of getting a bargain. And so the occasional discount at Starbucks or Costa or Harvester, it makes me happy. So I want to pass that happiness to you. If you're like me, then download the Too Good To Go app and see what's local near you. How can you help the environment? And also get yourself a bargain from the places that you already like to eat at. Oh, and while you're there, also download the Protrusive app. Now, let's go ahead and join the main episode with Dr. John Swabrick and Dr. Neil Jaswell. Dr. John Swabrick and Dr. Neil Jaswell, welcome back again. Welcome to the Protrusive podcast. How are you guys? John, how are you doing? I'm very well. All good. I'm all happy. Up here in, in the uh, clinic. You're squeezing this in between uh, patients, right? Yeah. So I still work five days a week, much to my... Uh, probably I should be <laughs> scaling back a bit at my age, but I'm still at the cold face Monday to Friday. That's amazing. So. Um, you love it so much. Absolutely, yeah. They say if you love your job, you never work a day in your life. So I still enjoy it. So I'm still working. Great. And for those of you, those of our listeners and watchers uh, who haven't heard of you before, seen you before, just tell us about where you work and a bit about you as a, as a dentist, as a person. Yep. So I, I'm born and bred in the Midlands. Mum and dad are all Irish, so they moved over. Um, grew up in the Midlands in Nuneaton. And then I came to Leeds as a student in 1988 qualified, graduated in 1992, and I've never left Leeds ever since. So I don't know if I'd class myself as an honorary Yorkshireman nowadays. I've spent more of my life in, in Leeds in Yorkshire, and I'm still working in the first practice that I came out. So back in those days, VT, it was called FD, as it's now known, was optional. So I came out and went into practice. I did a little bit of a part-time hospital job. Hospital jobs, I worked as sort of like a staff grade in oral surgery, at BRI, for a few years as well, and then just worked basically in the practice, which... I ended up buying then about four or five years, a little bit by default, really, not with any planning, just because the current principal decided it had enough and it was a case of either you buy it or I'm closing the place down. So I became a practice owner at a fairly youngish age and then mm. I've been here ever since. And then I set up a referral practice, which will be probably 10, 11 years ago in Harewood with um, Don Sloss, who was previous president of BACD and Mark Willings, a local colleague. And I'd met them Amazing. because I ended up going through the Royal College and doing, you know, MFGDP. I did a diploma, I did my MSc, and then a completed fellowship. So I just kept on coming across and bumping into those guys because they were part of that training pathway as well. So we ended up setting a practice up together, which um, I'm now coming out the other end of my career because Farsley, where I'm here today and working, we sold to Dentex, which is recently merged with Portman. 
and Harewood we sold to Booper. So I'm now, as I hate, well, I'm 54 now. So I'm now Congratulations. hitting that back end of my career where I'm <laughs> out slowly, but without as much of the day to day hassle, shall we say, of running the surgery. Well, we need to extract everything out of your head because the, the, the beauty is with your, and I've seen your lecture, I've seen your work, it is truly top end. Uh, and what I admire about you is this uh, ethos, which a lot of successful dentists I look up to have, which is staying in one place for a long time, seeing your failures come back, and no doubt you would have had that. And right. so the, the, it's very much in, in going with the theme of what we're discussing today, right? How yeah. many times it would have happened to you, because it happens to all of us, whereby you prep a tooth and it becomes hot, hot pulp, and things change, and those conversations they need to have probably they've they've changed as you've changed as you've developed as a clinician those conversations your attitudes have changed as well so i'm looking yeah. forward to, to delving deep into that but just before we do i'm going to introduce neil neil you're a veteran on the show you were there on episode four and you know way back when when it began and also recently as well in the sort of medical legal uh, series uh, just remind us uh, about you my friend uh, what is it that you do uh, thank you jazzy and thank you for having me back again i'm a private practitioner Got my own practice here in Hertfordshire and, you know, very much involved with that with my wife, Kamal. And we started PDI, which is an indemnity company, five, six years ago now, and it's grown and grown. So that takes up a lot of my time as well, as well as, as you know, Jazz, we both have the little ones and that's another full-time job. No, so really enjoying it and really blessed and uh, just wish the weather was a bit nicer today so I could take the little one out. But um, just, I was just reflecting back on John, we met probably 14 years ago at Harewood House yeah. for a... A breed end to all on four thing, I think. Yeah, yeah. And uh, he was a young whippersnapper then and uh, actually caught my eye. And interestingly, we are on the same WhatsApp groups. And whenever we give advice to youngsters, because, you know, they go down a very narrow path and they don't look wide, we both say the same thing, you know, what's the occlusion? Yeah. What's the patient want? Where's the smile line? So I think we're very much in simpatico in there. So I'm looking forward to. Well, John, um, I, I what saw you le lecture recently. We were there lecturing together in Yorkshire, uh, and uh, it, like I say, it was, it was fun, fun, fantastic. Uh, I'm sure you're a really nice guy. I want to sit with you more and, and, and learn more about. But I have to say that Neil is, for me, is the nicest guy in dentistry. Right? He's a nice guy in dentistry, uh, and he's so approachable. So I want to just uh, commend Neil on that. So uh, let's dive into the scenario. Long story short, right? You're going to prep a tooth for a crown, but as you've done that, as soon as you've done that, the tooth now is, is suffering in pain. The patient's in pain. You've basically set off a pulpite basically uh, and the, it's a difficult conversation that you need to have with the patient now the difficulty of that conversation will depend on the pre-conversations that you had before but um, that's a, the, the, the sort of in a nutshell I'm gonna now just for make it into scenario Neil's very kindly prepared this right so tooth loses vitality after a crown so here's the official scenario that we can just you know that kind of like a role play thing but let, let, let's just set the scene Mr. Smith is a 65 year old retired GP and he comes in with a large cracked amalgam we see large cracked amalgams all the time it's asymptomatic really key point here an asymptomatic molar so patient's perception is different here you've discussed his options with him and agreed to do an onlay which he subsequently returns for and then you fit the, the onlay and it becomes sensitive you look after the patient you recommend some sensitive toothpaste and he continues to suffer with his teeth and is now avoiding eating on it a month later he comes back with a throbbing pain he's very upset as a tooth was absolutely fine before you touched it what do you do? So how do you want to begin to unpack that, John? I have this rule, and I'm going to give this away to you now. I call it the four R's. So whenever we see something like that and it's asymptomatic, there's always four things that I always talk about with people. And I say there's four R's that we can do this. We can review it, we can repair it, we can restore it, or we can remove it. What, what would you like us to do, particularly if it's asymptomatic? Because at that time, I think, well, what experience has taught me is if, Keith, if teeth could talk, they'd ask us not to drill them. So sometimes <laughs> the less intervention we do, particularly with this asymptomatic, is there isn't a problem there, but there might be a problem coming down the line. So it's how that patient perceives that and how they would like to manage it. And again, I have two things I always say to people. Are you a proactive or a reactive person? How would you like us to manage this? Because at the minute, mm. I can show you now, the, the great thing we have nowadays is scanners, intraoral cameras. So he may perceive that he doesn't have a problem, but we can see and probably know that coming down the line, there's a problem. So if we do nothing with that tooth, that crack is open, it's probably absorbing bacteria. And by our intervening, we've just accelerated what possibly would have happened already with this tooth. But of course, it was fine until we touched it. So else touching it means that we then own the problem. So my starting point always with that is, I mean, thankfully we have a scanner in the surgery so I can scan him, I can show him and blow him up, show him the cracked amalgam. 
And then I can instantly say, how do you want to do this? Are you a proactive reactive? Because at the minute you're getting any, no pain, but the chances are that this will either, you'll bite and it will break. And are you happy managing that in a reactive way? We might be shut. It might be the weekend. You might be on holiday. It might be Christmas Eve. You might not be able to get in. You might get discomfort. And so I'm trying to give him his problem for me so he can tell me how he wants to manage that risk. If we leave it, I like that, John, and something similar to, to what I do because I, you know, to, to really make the best decision for the patient, you need to understand the patient more. And so, there, uh, I, I guess, is risk aversion that attitude towards risk yeah. in life in general will reflect yeah. the decision they're likely to make. And, and we have loads of patients who's like, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? That's my best Yorkshire accent, right? If it ain't broke, don't, don't fix it. And, and, and we need still, uh, how do we consent that kind of individual that actually, uh, when the proverbial hits the fan, don't go uh, blaming me for something I advise you? How do you say that in a nice way? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I think, I mean, we've had, like you say, this is a scenario, we've had one, if not two in already this morning like this. And I, I work in Leeds, West Yorkshire, where we have wall to wall amalgams. Every tooth is a massive amalgam that has some sort of defect, ditch, crack, failure in it. And if I treated all of them, I'd never leave the surgery. So, and a lot of those teeth are fine. You know, you see those teeth and they do last and last and last. And some people's approach is likely to say, just leave it. I just don't want them touching. The downside is if you're kicking the can down the road, which, you know, we'll all look and say, I know it's not bothering you now, but I know it's more than likely. And I, I like to use non-definitive terms like more than likely. It might not be bothering mm. you now, but more than likely, and that could be next week, next month, next year, this will cause you a problem. What we can do is talk about how we can manage it so we can review it. If you're happy leaving it, that's fine, except that it might blow up. But I don't need to be disappointed if you're then ringing, trying to get in, for a treatment and it's happening at a bad time mm -hmm. because you know there always then becomes my fault if I've not then told them and informed them. If they're happy to review it, roll it on. But I then tend to say, what I'll do is I'll summarize the options that were spoken for you into a letter. And over my 20 plus years, I have a library of consent letters. That means I can sit and I call it my little green book. It gets written down in there. And then on that page uh -huh. is all the clinical bits and pieces. So I make a point of writing it down. Now, some of that for me is dramatic demonstration for the patient. It actively shows that I write their name down, what it is. And I'll say, you're in my green book and I will do for you a letter in the next I day. I love that. Day, which will then summarize out. <laughs> so for me, that's easy. I'll type into my Word database, upper left six, uh -huh. core or crown or fill. And it produces up yeah. a template letter that I can then personalize and say you presented today, this was the scenario, these are all your different options and this is what all the different costs are. And then this is coming back from a Royal College days when we had to do for all the exams. You know, there's a little bit of prognosis, there's a bit of presenting complaint, past dental history, risks and benefits, um, maintenance, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a little sort of standard paragraphs that apply that I can very quickly mm -hmm. tweak to that. I email that over to my team. That and that goes out. Brilliant. Well, but before I get to expand on that and, uh, and zoom in on certain things, Neil, any comments so far from, from your perspective? Hey guys, it's Jazz interfering here with a message. So Dr. Neil Jaiswell, one of the guests on this episode right now, was also featured in Indemnity versus Insurance recently. So if you haven't listened to that, please do check it out. He represents PDI, Professional Dental Indemnity, and they really are the nice guys in indemnity and insurance. Now, if you are due a renewal for your insurance or indemnity or more dental malpractice, then you need to get a quote from these guys. You need to get a quote from PDI. The best way to do it is go to protrusive.co.uk forward slash insurance. Remember that insurance is like the newer, sexier, better cousin of indemnity, and it offers you the highest level of protection, and they offer claims made policies and claims occurred policies. So if you don't know what I'm talking about, you need to listen to that indemnity versus insurance episode. But if you do a quote, if you do a renewal with your indemnity, then do check out protrusive.co.uk forward slash insurance. By visiting that link, you do get £100 off your quote. So whatever your quote is, you will get a £100 discount for being a Protruserati. And as this is a paid partnership, you also help to support the podcast. So why not join me and hundreds of other dentists to switch your indemnity to PDI? That's protrusive.co.uk forward slash insurance. And let's join the main episode again. I think two things. One is what we might get out of this. And I know, Jazz, you like tools for your listeners because they're going to do a prep tomorrow. And I think I'm almost working with John's help and with your help and a little algorithm of what are the key points that we should have. And we can perhaps put that together as a PDF or something. One of the things yeah. John probably does mention, but he didn't mention just now, there's also the risk of doing and the risk of not doing. And yeah. they both mm -hmm. have complications. So it's really important that you might say, oh, we'll kick it down the road as you said or 
you know, if you want to review it, but actually we may lose the tooth because that crap could propagate. Yeah. John, I'm sure, John, that's something you tell them. Oh, 100%, yeah. The con the, 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 there's pros and cons, actions and consequences, no matter how you are. Um, and if we do nothing, yeah. one of the potential consequences is always tooth loss. And that comes then down into risk profile as well. For some people, the thought that they may bite and it causes a fracture that leads to tooth loss. They don't want to be sat there thinking, oh, I wish I'd done that. And that uh, some of it comes down to as well. I mean, I, I, I wrote down some notes before we did this and I, you picked up on it. <laughs> and if you get to know your patients and you stay a long time, they're less likely to sue you. That That's probably just a fact, mm -hmm. basically. That they build trust with you. Mm -hmm. So when you have lots of conversations with your patients all the time, you, you get to know personality type, how they are, how they like to be fed information mm -hmm. and how they like to receive information. And you get better at spotting the personality types that are more likely to give you a problem down the line. And, and there mm -hmm. are some people who always want to shift blame. It's never their fault. It's not their problem. It's our problem because we didn't diagnose it. We didn't treat it soon enough. And you know, as people living longer and keeping their teeth longer, we are seeing more tooth wear, cracks and failure. And, and some of those are incredibly difficult to diagnose and manage, even with this simple scenario mm -hmm. here. At which point do you mm -hmm. intervene with an old filling that's perhaps been there 30 years that's showing signs of breakdown? Um, a lot of times they've got these pins and by the time you remove the amalgam, you've got nothing left anymore, right? Uh, and then you're like, hang on a minute, it was doing just fine and now I've dismantled it and actually how am I going to place a crown uh, on, on this? Yeah. So it becomes really tricky actually and, and one of the challenges there is, I mean, let, let, let's take this a, a step further then. Let's say with your communication, you've done the scan, they're in yeah. your green book, you sent the letter yeah. out uh, and yeah. a few weeks later they say, you know what, uh, I my risk profile is that uh, I'd rather not kick the can, I would like this treated now to reduce my chance of tooth loss. Okay. The yeah. patient then goes on to have a crown and yeah. then uh, the patient uh, has a sensitivity and it v v blows up into an, into an endo, basically needing an endo. Yeah. Now, what can we do before it gets to that point in terms of the consent and the chat that you have? Because now the patient's on board, but how do you then warn them that actually by me touching it, I'm going to make it worse? But that's the whole point yeah. of consent. They need to know that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that comes in my standard letter. So when I've said to them, I'm explaining mm -hmm. the four mm -hmm. R's, part within that letter is the risk. Mm -hmm. So pros and cons, benefits mm -hmm. of treatment. And within there, I'll put there is a certain number of teeth that as a result of this procedure will end up needing root canal treatment. There is a separate fee for this and that fee is X, Y, Z. So I've put that into the initial letter, which they sign mm -hmm. initial to go and consent with treatment before they start. So, so, so the, the, you, put, you consent them for the fee for the additional root canal as well, right? That's in the letter, yeah. right? So if you need root canal, it will be this much. And I think that's important. Yeah, yeah. So that, that's in there and the pre-consented. So I, I think there's a chap called Peter Thompson who is a bit of a management guru. So it's not what you say, it's what you say before you say what you're going to say mm. that matters. So that always mm. stuck in my head in terms of, I'm no different. Mm. I'm a consumer the same as the rest of us are. You know, mm -hmm. probably by nature as dentists, we're detailed individuals. We like data. <laughs> we absorb stuff. Mm -hmm. So if I'm going to go and make a purchase, I want to know if there's going to be a back end and something might go wrong. I'm okay. Just tell me about it first so it doesn't come as yep. a surprise. I, I, mm -hmm. I think sometimes if we haven't communicated that, then we, you know, we shouldn't be surprised if patients pull us on it. We know it's happened, but if you haven't warned or told them and explained that there might be a, an expense to it, you, you, you shouldn't be surprised if patients uh, then push back a bit at you. Well, we'll talk about that scenario in a moment, Neil. I think just from a consent point of view, you've obviously written a consent letter and you've said these risks and there it's a general letter. Yeah. And I think consent, as you know, is an ongoing process and an individual process. And I think what's also useful would be your notes on the prep day, because yeah. then you can actually, you've got your picture of beforehand, so you've got your scan. I take a picture after I've taken the amalgam out. Here's the cracks, here's the leaking, here's what it looks like. Yeah. And I might write minimal caries, moderate caries, deep caries. What do I think the likelihood of risks is it, um, you know, likely, unlikely? Do I repeat any warnings with more gravitas now? So you've gone from a general, your green book, yeah. to actually this is what we found on the day, communicating that even yeah. before the patients come back for the fit, moisture control or whatever, so that you're mm -hmm. sort of fine-tuning your risk as you go along and making it relevant and pertinent. Yeah, yeah. It's a continual thing. It's not a one-time thing. I remember having surgery once many years ago, uh, and the surgeon came in, and, 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 he, and, he, and he looked to me, and he's like, why are you here? what are you doing? And I thought, am I in the right place? Is this the right surgeon? You know, why is he asking me these things, right? But I said, uh, I'm here for this procedure. He's like, why? I'm like, uh, because X, Y, and Z. 
And I loved it because it really, I, I knew what he was, I got to the, oh yeah, that's what he did. And so I do this with my patients. So if I had that kind of scenario, John and Neil, yeah. where hey. I, I've, I've had that pre-chat, I've done that green book, I've done that letter and they've agreed and now they're coming back in, I'm going to say, why are you here today? Is it, oh, I'm going to get that filled. Mm-hmm. Okay, okay, why? Why are we doing this? Oh, so it's not a big problem further down the line. And then my question is, what are the risks of doing it? And I let them say, oh, yeah, I might, you said, oh, yeah, you, you or they, they usually forget. And I say, oh, let me remind you, there's a chance of my new canal. I've looked at your uh, risk category. You are asymptomatic. So it's on the lower side. But, you know, if I was to put a number to it, I might say one in five, one in four. I just make whatever's appropriate yeah. for them, basically, right, with yeah. the crack and stuff. And I give them that, basically. Another thing yeah. I do, Jazz, is maybe not for a non-lay case, but where it's a bit more complicated, people get confused with different teeth. I'll get a pen and paper with a chart, and they'll write down in their own words, upper left six is fractured. If I don't do anything this, why should I do it? What's the cost? And then they'll have a page of their own treatment plan, which I then scan into my notes and they take it away with them. So it's very hard to ignore that you've written something down in your own writing and it wasn't told or you didn't Brilliant. understand. Brilliant. So they are writing this as a, as a summary. So they're taking notes on your discussion. Yeah. And I said, wow. would you like I a pen never paper? Heard that I think, That's cool. I think it's a, there's a lot to take in here and I need to make you a, a, a dentist. You know, if you're a dentist, then we can be on a level playing field. So I, I teach them a, bit, a little bit about charting. I'm going to just uh, go back to the scenario, John, and you probably will never have it, where this poor dentist has done what he's thought best for this doctor, hasn't written the notes up, hasn't got a scanner, thought he was it's an easy yeah. win, and now sort of the medical legal aspect is actually, I don't want to pay £1,200. You never told me this could happen. What would your communicate, and you, you're now the principal and maybe it's one of your associates, how would you talk to that patient about what's happened, why it's happened, and what would you do about it? Yeah, I, I think obviously because we know it's nobody's fault, it, it just happens. And so the central piece in that is always cost to the patient. Time out of the workplace, inconvenience, as well as financial. And you can make that go away. And the biggest softener is making the financial go away. <laughs> so with those cases, the easiest thing for me is to say, look, Nobody wanted this to have happened, but it's recognised there's nobody at fault here. But we appreciate that you've ended up now with a tooth that wasn't causing a problem and now is causing a problem. What we'd like to be able to do is fix that for you. And on this occasion, as a gesture of goodwill, we'll be able to finance that for you. If you want to stand your ground, you end up then having a fight. But that emotionally takes a lot of time, effort and energy, particularly if it's then escalated into complaints and handling it. So... In my time, I'm just I clarifying, look- John. I'm just clarifying. This is this is a scenario. Yeah. You'll be offering this kind of we'll do the root canal for you only if you found that we, as the clinician, didn't do our due diligence and we didn't warn. That's the only time. Because yeah. if you did all the warnings and everything yeah. by the book and it blows up, you're not going to yeah. give them a free root canal, right? No, yeah. no. If the, if, I, if the paperwork and the communication hasn't been there, and it happens, you know, I've been there. It's happened to me in the past. I, for me, when we're building the practice, I'm after lifetime patients. So I want that patient to go away. I want him to tell his friends and I want him to come back. And if he comes to me for the next 30 years of my career, the value to me and my practice in terms of what he'll potentially invest and spend within the practice is massive. I don't have to go out and market for patients if I've got a base of really good people. And occasionally things go wrong. And it's the same again for us as consumers. If you're anywhere and you're having a meal at a restaurant and it isn't quite on point, but they come over and say, do you know what? We've not quite hit it today, but don't worry about the drinks. We'll take care of those for you. You end up mm-hmm. telling people, you turn a, a negative into a positive. Oh, I can't believe we went there. I tell you what, the bloke who owns it is brilliant, though. If you have a chat and it's mm-hmm. not quite on point, he does this. And I think that's what builds your brand locally. You know, both our practices are very different that I've worked mm-hmm. in and owned. Farsley's a very community-based local practice. You know, I walk up the road, I'll bump into all my patients everywhere. You know, my children go to school locally, so I will be meeting and greeting the wider public all the time. Harewood's a little bit more niche, Mm -hmm. a little bit more referral, but the people who come there have, I would say, nice people have nice friends. (laughs) So you you want Mm -hmm. to leave them all the time feeling warm and cosy about their experience Mm -hmm. with you. So as a Mm -hmm. consumer, for me, occasionally, I think we have to recognise if things haven't gone well, just, you know, hold up, admit it, and then... Sometimes just take the finance out of it. It'll always come back to you. That, that patient will spend that money with you further down the line, probably. And if as long and you've as you diverted a potential complaint, which is yeah, the, main, the main thing. Yeah. And you meet each other. It, it, it de- de-escalates everything at that point. Isn't it nice to hear, Jazz, how to get new patients? Do the right thing. Be in one place. Admit your failures. Look after the patient. 
You don't have to do TikTok dances to get patients. You just have to have That's integrity. Fr- Frank Frank Spear says that his 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 view on failure is that listen. I just want to go in and fix it. I just want to help, right? And it, yeah. it, you know, so when you when we drop the ball and we can see that, and sometimes that we can clinically drop the ball, like you know, we, we, we're going to talk about one of the scenarios about a perforation Neil, in the future, right? We're going to have an endo guess, and we're talk about perforation. What happens when we when we perforate, right? So we then again goes back to the consent. But when things go wrong, sometimes you got to say, okay, you know what? The communication aspect, you know, me or my colleague dropped the ball here. So let's really look after this patient and and, and make sure this doesn't go any further. I think that's exactly the the, the point you're making, John, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Sometimes it's just nobody's fault sometimes it just happens and then for me it's i think the best business is always relational business where you get on well with people mm-hmm. and every now and then it doesn't hurt to give a little bit away to receive back for 20 years something coming back you know you can't underestimate what lifetime value and patients who mm-hmm. learn to trust you and you can turn that negative into a positive mm-hmm. And, you know, instead of spending 1,200 quid on a marketing campaign, that's your marketing campaign right there by just doing the right thing. Mm-hmm. Now, now, Neil, I'm just going to ask a question here. Now, let, let's say we have a scenario whereby this has happened and uh, really look, look back at your notes and perhaps either you didn't warn them as well as, well as you should have or you didn't write it in notes, which is just as good as it didn't happen, right, yeah. and unfortunately, right, because right. the patient's got selective hearing. So uh, in this scenario, the, they now need a root canal, but it's a, it's a complex root canal. This was a sclerosed pulp kind of right. thing, and endodontist needs to do it, and let's say it's going to cost the patient a grand. Who's footing the bill? Should the associate have to pay reduce from the associate's gross? Is the indemnity who needs to pay? Who, who, who pays for this kind of stuff? Yeah. It's an interesting question. Well, let's say for me, like this, this patient came back. I did, my notes got, went missing that day, so I can't say that we've had the conversation, let's say. And the, the poor doctors come back in, you know, with pulpitis or real pulpitis. So I would have a conversation with him in the surgery. And that would kind of tell you where you're going. So let me explain what's happened here. Let me show you what pulpitis is. I've got CIC Medivision, which I quite like. And if he's a doctor and he's a bit scientific, he can understand inflammation and all that kind of stuff. And we'll go, this is what's happened to your tooth. Most likely it was going to happen anyway. And really, from our point of view, this is a complication that happens. There is a fee to that. And as a measure of goodwill, then from John's point of view, you either say we're going to pay for it. Yeah. I might say, look, you know, We'll, we'll both take a hit on this and would you like to go 50-50? That works quite a lot once you've had a little yeah, chat with yeah. them. Yeah. If they're uppity, obtuse, not so great, and you know that they're not going to pay for it, what? then indemnity wouldn't pay for it because it's not a legal cost. It's not like a judge has said you owe some money. It's not a payment for something that's happened. It's a refund or it's a contribution. So mm. th- you could ask indemnity to pay for it, but I think you'd just shoot yourself in the foot because I think all that will happen is over a very small amount of money, you'll become a risk factor. Mm. And I think in this case, they would say, this is practice you're dealing with it in practice. It hasn't gone to the GDC. It hasn't gone to the lawyers. So how you want to deal with it internally. And there's a, there's a line where it'll come into our boat, uh, into, you know, into, our, into our hands, and there's a line where it's in your hands. So I think probably in this, it's better off resolved on a local level. And if it's an associate you know, issue, then it comes out of the associate wage. If your principal, uh, you know, you've been there 15, 20 years and you've got a great relationship and you're friends and you take one on the chin for each other, then that's a different conversation. But really, as a self-employed, and we're looking at um, the taxing and all those things, why would somebody else pay for your mistake as a self-employed business? I think there's two bits for me on that. I, I, I think I can add value on here is the first thing with complaint resolution is just asking the patient what they seem as success at the end of how, how, what, mm. how would you think this what's the best way for this to be resolved in your eyes is it would it be for free would it you know just ask them what the end point is and again I don't I try not to say shall we do it for free straight how would you like for us to put this back for you yeah. uh, I had an issue actually yeah. there's a it's a great point by the way I had something happened to my Jaguar I used to drive a Jaguar XF and they, they, they the garage cocked it up they did something wrong with it and it delayed things uh, and then so literally the business the manager asked me how would you like you know how can we make you happy how can we resolve this yeah. I was like I would like some money off for this, please. And he gave me 300 quid off. I was like, all right, that'll, that'll do me. So th- that's how I ca- carried on. So that's Good a great point. point. Yeah, yeah, because sometimes that's where, which helps mitigate the fee. And, and exactly, you get a feel. And sometimes as a third party, I'll use it, whereas principal or clinical lead, I can sort of say, look, yeah. tell me what you need and what you'd like to happen, because I can then go back, speak with the dentist. We can chat down as a clinical group within the practice as a management team, and we'll see if we can help you with that. So I won't always guarantee that I can meet it there and then. 
for them. I can just take that information and understand and then I can come back to them. So if we meet as a third party, so if it comes in as a complaint or it's escalated that way, then that's our complaints procedure where we meet, try to resolve at a local level. And then I'll ask them, what does success look like? And then sometimes I can suggest Mm -hmm. enough. If we were able to make that happen, would that be okay for you? Yeah, that'd be great. And then it's an easy conversation, Mm -hmm. say, behind the scenes. And I think the second point when I'm chatting with the associates, particularly nowadays with HMRC, is I don't think we can be seen as a practice and a business to be mitigating things that they've done as an independent. I think that's one of the key areas, isn't it, with underlining associate and self-employed status, is that you end up having to, in effect, fund things that haven't then gone well and refunds and put things right. That that comes out of their pocket rather than a shared expense because that, that might stray into are they employed rather than self-employed. So I think there's an element of that that I've seen before where people have sort of said, no, actually, contractually, yeah. you need to pay for your own work if you've been paid for it in this mm-hmm. way to put it right that way. And then maybe behind the scenes you can mm-hmm. mitigate as a 50-50 you know, as long as it's not happening that often, you know, it'll happen to all of mm-hmm. us all the time. This, yep. you know, it's mm-hmm. just yep. a case of when, not if. It is a blurry line that self-employed employed. Like yeah, how far yeah. do they need to bring their own equipment in? Ideally, you know, yeah. do they provide locums? So it is a tricky one. But yeah. I think if it was a refund as a principle, I, I might take a hit on it and go 50-50. If yeah. it's a contribution or, or the same split the as whatever they're on, right? Yeah, well, whatever, either split yeah. on it. And um, if it's the endodontist, then I would say, look, really, this is for you to contribute to. And the endodontist might say, look, you know, you referred me 10 patients, you know, I'll, 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 I'll sort you out here. It's a conversation, as you said, with lots of people. But yeah, yeah, it's a great point, John. And I forgot to sort of say, actually, just asking how can we help you? What would, what would make, you know, how can we want, we want a win-win. What's a win-win for everybody here? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So we're coming up to the, the end of this podcast. I'm going to ask you a final comment. So what we covered beforehand is uh, the clinical element of, you know, sometimes just monitor the, the, the four R's that you gave were brilliant. And then if the patient chooses that they would like this treated and you think it's a, a, a suitable treatment, uh, you've got to give the warnings and, and have the letter and give the fee for a potential root canal. Now, hopefully there's asymptomatic teeth, uh, a low percentage of them hopefully uh, will, will go on to need this kind of a treatment, but it's quite distressing for the patient. And if you've done all your hard work, then the patient will have already been aware of the risk and then you they will pay for the root canal and uh, you just say oh, I'm so sorry it's happened let's extirpate let's get you out of pain let's get you off to the endodontist kind of thing right that's the ideal scenario but if they kick up a fuss either because they either because they have selective hearing or you didn't do your due diligence then you've got to have more conversations just like the ones we discussed so as a final comment uh, any contributions uh, John I'll start with you yeah no you'll get some people who simply have lost trust lost faith in you and they don't want to come back again again for me it's about mitigating trying to turn that negative into a positive in some case it's just a case of refunding just saying really sorry it hasn't worked out this you know we've done our best ability here you know you paid this towards the crown. If this helps going towards you, the treatment, you know, I'd like to, I would say, I'd like to think if we walk past each other in the street, we'd be able to smile, <laughs> um, shake hands if we needed to. And I wouldn't have to, you know, I was, we've got a big Asda that's just up the road from us. I would say, I would, I'd hate to think I was hiding in the fruit and veg section to try and avoid you. <laughs> you know, none of us want that. You know, I love you know, that. I, most of us are dentists get yeah. up and to do a good job yeah. for patients. And occasionally it yeah. doesn't work out. Yeah. It's just, unfortunately, culture and climate now looks for somebody to blame. People demand perfection all the time. And it you know, mm. just simply doesn't exist. You know, Things don't play out. Mm. And sometimes it's nobody's fault. It's just biology and science and you know, just stuff mm. happens, unfortunately. And it's trying to mitigate that. And occasionally you'll come across that person who, for whatever reason, personality type, and they'll have a trait. That's how they are in life. Um, and you, you yes. find them and, and do you know what? You're better off out of your life. Get rid of that stress. Give them the money back because as soon as that monkey comes off your shoulder, you'll just feel better. Whereas if you carry internalize that stress and trying to make it right, don't you can't fix everybody, you know, and certain personalities just won't mesh. I'm so conclu- uh, concur with everything John said. If you are in that situation where this happens to you and you get away with it, don't just think I've got away with it and keep making the mistake. You know, do your checklist, have a little look at what could I have done better. Yeah. You know, next time you might not be so lucky. If, if they're not right for you or not right for practice, definitely, you know, same with anyone in your life, you know, family, friends, staff, whatever. Create a positive culture around you and have positive people. And like uh, John said, nice people have nice friends. And that's, you know, that's definitely the case. But yeah, just make sure you've got consent, your photos are prop, you know, your periapicals are in the right place, EPT, risk of doing, risk of not doing. I like the uh, four R's, cost of failure, cost of complication, 
good contemporaneous notes. Intro or camera, if, if it's a crack, you tell people it's a crack, they don't understand. You show them a crack, they go, oh my God. And they're expecting it to go wrong. And thank God you've intervened in time. So I really like intro oral camera, mm-hmm. maybe more than the uh, scanner. I know scanner is flashier, but yeah. everyone will have one. But intro oral cameras, you can get them cheap on Amazon. Yeah. Um, so I would, I would say photography and communication and a rapport building. And if you get into trouble, please learn from it. Don't just keep going down the thing and blaming the system you're working in. Just reflect mm-hmm. on it and uh, take it as a, a positive experience. I'll give one last addict out there, Neil. Somebody always said to me when you have a problem, there's three things you need to remember. What are you going to stop doing? Start doing. Keep doing. <laughs> so anytime you have a problem, yeah. break it down into those three yeah. areas and think, I'm not going to do that again. I'm definitely going to do that again. I'm going to keep on doing that again. And then usually you'll reflectively well, learn and hopefully move forward because dentistry is constant reflective learning. That's what it is. It's a lifetime of reflective learning for me. And good marriage advice, John, as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> G- G- gentlemen i just want to thank you for, for your time today but because you, you come on the show give up your time i really want you to to, to talk about your referral practice john uh, any teaching that you do how can we get in touch with you where what channels uh, can we reach out to you on i do a little bit of teaching nowadays but less and less it's just being away from home and time away from families have got a bit older so do a little bit basically which is my main area and focus tends to be treating wear case so i treat and do a lot of wear cases all the time as you saw with the lecture so it tends to be on that education and a process that i've developed over years and there's various systems one of the systems that align with is smile fast so a little bit of teaching on their program and we run an advanced course for them over two days and that's probably about all i do nowadays on that as and apart from if the bda or anybody locally just asks to do stuff Harewood is just, it's now owned by Booper, and um, that's a referral only practice, which is in Leeds, and then my other practice, which is a bit more community, sort of more normal, just day to day sort of stuff is at Farsley. We, you know, we accept some referrals as well over there for there, and it tends to be where bonding failure cases where people have found that it hasn't perhaps gone as they'd expected and they need a little bit of help so we step in and you know help out colleagues really for me that's more as a SEMA role nowadays it's you know let's let's help if you've got a problem it's not a problem send them over we'll see if we can help you know it's it's a lonely world is dentistry at times and we don't mm. talk to each other enough and so I like to you know I'd say referral but it's just you know I've got 30 plus years of experience and I've made every mistake going so sometimes as part of my reflective learning loop i can fix or see sometimes i think i said i've moved into that phase of life where it's become almost subconscious competence i've seen and done it so many times i sort of know (laughs) what the answer looks like because i've trodden that path so many times so yeah that that's what referral is for me is working just as part of people's wider team to help them not not have a bad day really Neil, you're in danger of getting usurped as the nicest man dentistry here. Uh, John, honestly, re- re- that's really good of you, and right. uh, it's fantastic. Keep doing what you're doing. Uh, Neil, tell us about PDI and how we can get in touch. Uh, yeah, more than welcome to uh, get in touch with PDI if you need any indemnity. or Again, if you just need some informal advice, we're always happy to help. Again, with John, it's about helping colleagues because these situations can be stressful for people, and as again, yes, it's, yeah. as John said, it's a lonely world. So uh, Neil, which is N-E-L at professionaldentalindemnity.co.uk or Facebook, Instagram, Messenger, you know how to find me. Amazing. So there we have it, guys. What will you change about your practice to make sure you don't get bit by this scenario ever again? We discuss lots of tangible points, lots of actionable points that I want you to make sure you pledge to change about your practice straight away. There are lots more scenarios where this came from, such as what should you do if you, for example, perforate the pulp of floor, or if your patient has some cosmetic work done by you and they're unhappy afterwards. How do you manage these tough scenarios? So please do stay tuned for those. And if you want to get CPD for listening to this all the way to the end, you deserve it. You should head over to protrusive.app. The website is protrusive.app. And if you answer a few questions, you get a certificate emailed to you by my team. And all it costs you to access everything on the platform is the cost of a Nando's per month. Don't forget that you also get access to VertiPrep for Plonkers. We've already had one webinar. The next live webinar is on the 29th of November. So I hope to see you there. I just want to just thank again to my team, Erica Alan Benitez, who is my producer, Marie, who manages CPD, and the premium notes for this episode were done by Chriselle Fakun. And thanks to you once again, producer Rati, for making it all the way to the bitter end. I really appreciate it. I'll see you same time, same place next week. Bye for now. Hold up. 